All right, all right, all right. Welcome to the Splice Poetry Series. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for coming here. Thank you for coming here. And you, and you, and you. Not so much you, but you, and you, and you, and you, and you, 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 you. Y'all three or four of the bar over there, thank y'all for coming here. Y'all four in the back row, y'all four in the upper rows. Hell yeah, thank y'all for coming here. We're happy to have y'all here. at one of the finest poetry readings in the city. Thank you for coming here as well. Hell yeah. Welcome. Welcome, welcome to the Splice Poetry Series. We have two great poets for y'all tonight. Um, Adele and Hank are going to kick some heels off on you. And we're gonna have Henry come up and introduce our first reader this evening. So come on up, Henry, to this tall microphone. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. One of Adele Elise Williams' manuscripts in progress is called Wager. One definition of the word goes something like betting on an unpredictable event. A risk is involved. Now, depending on who you ask, risk is either preciously abundant or head-scratchingly absent in the mother load of American poetics at this moment in time. Either way you blow it, there's gold in these Saturn bar hills. Saliva is the same whether it's spit or drool, you know what I mean? In an era where avant-garde modality seems to be surging into ellipticals, not unlike a dog slobbering with the zoomies running in circles when they have too much energy and they know what to do with, the will of the poet, or at its worst, pop topicality, takes a backseat to the poetics, gets grafted into the process itself, becomes a speed trap. In contrast, Adele's poetics hits the freeway running. In fact, Adele hits the gas so hard, quote, all the faces are highway blurs. And we might call it overdrive when the speaker notices, quote, I'm so far down the road, I got no clue how to get home. Float your hand through the window, and it's death that threads through the road tripper's fingers. The song out the radio is a snowy mix of Stephen Crane's pitch black mar of an Old Testament god, the sassed utterances of Denise de Hamel, and the sardonic snarl of Catherine Wagner's first collection, Miss America, which always makes me think of the edginess of a pit bull in an evening gown. Quote, God says, kiss me. My body says, what's at stake? That's it, uh, Adele's poem, it comes from having a body. This rings of what DeHamel strives for in her poem, I think, artistic statement, quote, holy ghost poems that cannot be read, but only felt. One of many arcs and wagers from birth to death, a movement out of one poem's question, what does a preteen know of death besides dirt and worms? The answer swerves with a nod to fellow Houston poet, Paul Wall, I might even say, tipping on four fours. Okay, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe you don't know Paul Wall, that's fine. <laughs> Death a blurry focal point for the youthful speakers of the manuscript's first section, which comes closer and closer into focus as it proceeds in its funereal procession. Quote, I'm rolling down a hill, and the hill is made of holes. Those holes eventually come into focus like pockmarks on the oily cheek of Satan. That devil in those details, and those holes, and those holes, 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 holes the mother is a rope. Who wouldn't worship its maternal twines when she's the only thing down there with you? When it's your only chance to grab onto something other than yourself? The matriarchy here is ineluctably knotted together with the orange of a backyard extension cord the kind with the tips that glow to let you know the receptacle is hot. For instance, an imagist bike ride through the childhood neighborhood in the poem Covetous Ode, the violence that pulses in the neighborhood kid's cute little hearts, which then manifests in a boy getting his brain smashed in by falling off a cliff. In The Art of Recklessness, Dean Young likens the poet to, quote, one of those cartoon characters who has stepped off the cliff only to remain suspended. He goes on to say that the impossible is the first necessary condition of any faith. It is impossible to write poetry, therefore we do it without discipline. But you can jury rig discipline, Dean, and a motor still got to run on a pistol system. 
Whether the various iteration within yourself is, quote, a wazzy 20-something or a, quote, willy-lily ass that trembles with every shock of life, there's just something to Adele's journey, I believe, would resonate with anyone who's here to, who hears it. The audience just spare change jingling in a faded cargo pocket, quote, as though my joy, my little girl life, mattered to the entire world. Well, it just so happens that the entire world is in attendance tonight, so let's get to Matterin. Adele Elise Williams, everyone. introduction I've ever had so that was sick and I'm really excited I haven't been in New Orleans in a long time um, and I have I've, I grew up in Baton Rouge so New Orleans is was a second home so it's really special to be back it's special to be here and it's really awesome to be sharing the stage with Hank who whose work I've admired for a long time so I'm gonna read some poems I'll get to it Playing the field. When I was 12, I played on my first softball team. The girls were giants, were women. I was slight and losery. Surely there had been a mistake. Whenever something went hysterically wrong, mom used to say, God is punishing you. It was supposed to be a joke, but God punished me all the time. The girls were our crumb women, the thickets of hair on their heads and their legs, the thickest legs on young teens I had ever seen. They cranked the ball like a mower, pitched like a bullet. I never hit a hit, I never caught a fly. It was my most absurd failure yet. And my darling dad said, don't worry, sweet Adele, you'd be the star of a shit team. <laughs> Now please know that this was not my first sport. I had already failed basketball, gymnastics, and dance. When I started gymnastics the first day, I couldn't even roll. I couldn't put my big dumb head between my legs and roll. I begged my mom to never go back. I cried like every other quit, embarrassed and ashamed. I didn't learn my strengths until my 20s, and those strengths weren't even my real ones. They got me paid, they got me sad, it was a woolly bar, it was a shit team. It was a small shitty pond, and I was a big flashy fish, the brightest, trashiest star. I had skunk streaks in my hair above my ears, I had a gram of anything in my pocket, I had some money and jokes, I was hysterical, and everybody wanted to throw me a surprise party all the time. I found out I could smile for money. I could drink and sink for money. I could blank for money. It was my show, Mama. You're invited to the ceremony, but you cannot touch my trophy. You cannot hold my hand. In that train town, all they wanted was a pretty girl with visible scarring, eager tender to trade for, to bet on, and I was the best bet. Do not give me a six pack, a dark man, a dark night with black eyes and slick hair. Do not give me a high jump, a stiff board, a soft body of noir water, a sticky baggie, a soft, soft body. Don't give me a never been done, a too dangerous. Don't even try to give me a sweet name, Lucy, Mommy, Bunny, Pumpkin. They call it risk seeking behavior. I call it easy peasy lemon squeezy. <laughs> you know what is funny? How long it takes to truly know yourself. You know what is funny? How losing as a kid makes you so determined as an adult, even if it is for all the wrong goals, even if they aren't goals but drinks and drugs. If there is a winner winner chicken dinner of drugs and drinks, I won. If there is a slick girl with a thick wet throat, I won. My shit team made it all possible. I would like to thank God for my punishment and my shit team. <laughs> Essay on causation. 
The trouble with tuna is tuna smells. So if you have long hair and it gets in your tuna salad, you're fucked. You're fucked if the last word of your poem is poem or forever. You're fucked if you're in love, or if you're not in love, then you can be fucked too. It's not about getting screwed or being screwed. It's about the impossibility of loving someone or writing for effect or eating without a mess. You could be fucked mostly if you try too hard. If you try too hard or you don't try at all, or if you think whatever you are doing matters or doesn't. You will most likely fuck yourself if you mean to make a piece of art for a reason other than you want to. If you don't add onion to the tuna or relish where I'm from, or if you end a poem or a relationship on forever. Once I was fucked in a Nova on a dairy farm in the dead of night. It isn't about the fucking, it's about the cop who wrote the public fucking ticket. That was the shit's creek. The last word of a poem I read yesterday was cedar limbs. It was the second poem of the day where a woman fucked an animal. Maybe I'm fucking all wrong. I'm definitely trying too hard, so fucking myself there, and saying never, never, never far too much, so fucking myself there, and walking around with fish hair, so could be doing better there. <laughs> And I feel obligated to keep writing this poem to end it on the perfect word, and it can't be fucking, duh, or tuna, for that matter. It's just about how the mind will obsess you into doubt, or task, or fizzle. Bow. She's so helpless, and the undertone is spooky-ooky. She's so natural, and the assumption is heaven high, is gilded and gyrific, is like chakras, I mean placement for purpose, I mean outward burst. She's so blonde, and I mean blonde, like a dirty dove, how the most familiar thing becomes the opposite of gentle when dead. She means well when she asks you to touch her, when she negotiates the abyss. She only hopes to tell on herself. She's only making history. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Winning with rules. I'm accustomed to a certain amount of failure these days, like two dogs cautiously exchanging a bone. I note the arc, the climax, the moment of tense, and I bet on the top dog every time these days. I know the rules these days. I see the rules like one shot. And like recidivism, I return over and over to my own body, its deficits. I roll around on a stiff neck, a blue collar these days. I look behind myself, my body still forward, and I hoot. I holler like cheering on a winner, like a spotted wood owl, like Linda Blair and her devil body. I too need Christ. I too leave a pellet full of mystery bones found once and forever these days. There's no escaping myself. Too many people believe in me. I've built up too much hope for my own potential these days. But the joke is I met Jesus. I got the bone. Have you heard the news? I found my body. My head returned right. Christ compelled me. Have you heard the joke where the Holy Father walks into a bar and asks for a glass of water? Did anyone laugh? Did anyone get drunk? I'm gonna take a sip of my beer. <laughs> Okay, babe, I'm gonna need another beer. <laughs> <laughs> this next poem is about my nana, who is the reason I have roots in um, New Orleans at all. Her family, or my family, that part of the family is from Lake Charles, and she moved here right out of high school. And um, got a job delivering, I think, newspapers or something. She didn't know how to drive, so it's like this story we tell about her when we think about the type of woman that she was. Eventually, she opened a gift shop in the quarter, it's no longer there. But, and she's, she's no longer here. But anyway, this is about my Nana, for my Nana. Field notes. Right before Nana died, I bought her a Nico K CD. Nana clung to music like a mother's neck when her mind dipped out and her body went to town on tunes. 
then I was a fucking riot, and you know what? I'm rioting too. I'm spending 120 on skims. I'm filing my nails into anti-lyrics. I'm bracket-shaped and art, snatched all over a field, all skinny fat and assed. Think about anything possible, then put impulse on it. That's your field. When Nana died, I was absent like bunnies. I was losing somewhere spangled, throwing it all away for trouble, for thirsty allure. I posted queries on Reddit. I slathered my face leather in hyaluronic acid and aloe. I drank drink. I squatted. I sunned. Oh, fields, let's consider frost. Think birches. Think snow roads. Think desert places. Oh, frost and your filthy wood pile, your murderous shovel taking all the fields for your own melodramatic man performance. What about Han Solo and his sci-fi field? How about Ric Flair's meadow spectacle? Woo! Tom Hardy, all grassland and thick-dicked. Men on men and fields and fields and fields on men. What about how I'm attracted to toxic masculinity? How I want a mean man to lose me in his acreage? Oh, we're in territory now. We're risky, and it gets so much riskier. It gets brown butter. It goes tightrope. Well, you should know that Nana never opened the CD. That Nana remembered me tilled when she died, remembered me pasture, if at all. Thank you. This next poem is called Poser. I was my most favorite woman in Bozeman, Montana. Mecca was there, an essay in Julian. I shredded the beet for the salad with a fork. I did this thing, I cut every bit of my hair but the nape. I did this other thing, I ignored two deaths. At night, I played banjo in a band with enough people that it didn't matter if I was lying. In the morning, I stretched my hips out naked and geometrical. I poured extra milk over my oats. When I turned out the horses, I said, hi, baby, hi, and kissed the muzzle and then sucked real gentle on that fleshy bottom lip. Gentle, gentle friend. Julian played harmonica like the Titanic was almost under, and Mecca taught me Mancala. The moon winter, the ground's all gone to sleep. There can be so much pain and exploration. I have a mother and she missed me. Once a doting daughter, even two deaths could not unfake me. I had pretended myself into no self. When the sun was at its highest and I was at my highest and the snow fucked my shins, when I was 24 and fearless and in Bozeman, I ate so many beets my gallbladder quit. I kissed so many boys my chinny chin lit up like a slut light. Essay taught me short and bread and the horses never forgave me for forgetting them forever. Say what? The most painful thing I know is a mother. A shadow behind the sheet, but the sheet is the surface of a frozen over lake. The moment you first bust your own skin being called ugly. I can barely stand the sun, much less growing cold. It's not all so dark and down. It's funny too, like how I give my whole life to the idea of art, but nothing gives back. Like how no one matters and everything silenced gets the last laugh. Yeah, I'm cr cracking the fuck up, y'all. I'm rolling down a hill, and the hill is made of holes. Hey, I really will take a beer. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I still drink too much, obviously. Okay. <laughs> so this next poem um, is a, in response to the Rothko Chapel in Houston, which is this, I moved to Houston, and everybody was like, you gotta go to the Rothko Chapel, and I grew up Catholic, I mean, in Louisiana, and I 
looked into it and I was like, oh, this is like some woo woo, like non denomination shit or something. Like, but so I went and it, it was um, obviously impactful, but it's really small space. I mean, maybe 400, 500 square feet. Um, it kind of relies on its architecture to be sacred and to, to kind of like orchestrate, I think, the piece that it's able um, to create. And there's really nothing in it, is the other thing. I mean, you just kind of walk into this space and there's, it's, there, there's not much in there. Anyway, so this is called God Hunt. It doesn't take much, just an entire chapel, gigantic blacked out canvases, a few purple heart pews, some warm bodies, two attendants dressed like hyphens, a glass of house salve, a, plink, a pink plate piled with feta, miscellaneous shoe scuds and sniffles, deep diamond breaths, masks worn right, sunglasses if you're private, Something brittle, still broken, a wrongful, an itchy, all denim, gabapentin, an RSVP, a stream sound, a supper, zodiac stuff, strang sangria jug, SOS, a snake, just some saris, just some walls, like six, and some black paintings, like eleven, and a glass top, not stained. But holy, 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 all the same. Holy, holy, hold me, hold me, holy, whole, holding me. That's all you need. <laughs> hey, Hannah, take my body. When you cried and died, I figured, okay, I will take your dog and your hooker hoops and your mother on my shoulder, your father on my resume. What a sad show of reverie. What a bunch of love. I was thinking your rose gold nameplate. I was thinking your canine charity clutch. I was thinking your stonemason boyfriend and his book and jaw, his toad hands. When my other friends died, I got all their things. Silver serpent, cat eyes, high leather pumps. But you aren't really dead, just looking like it. You wept a bitch's worth of salt in those suicidal months. And though you did not all the way die, something sunk in your heart and festered there. So I gave you my own blood box, for starters. Your eyes were so pug, something had to be done. So beat beat, so tucked tight, so freshly fucked. Okay, Hannah, here are my windows. They are green like infection and bright like money. My hands were next because you needed to help yourself, then armpits because you envied my fuzz. Adios, stitch pits. Take care of my knees, they lock on their own. Notice my moonbed nails, my strawberry stress spots, the flop in my mouth. Okay, you can take these tiny tits. Okay, you can take this phone voice. Okay, you can take my picture skin show. Okay, you can take the cake. Do not misplace my long neck. You can use it to swallow or be a bird forever. Do not forget to pill all the pills. Do not forget to breathe breath. It is only life, you sick bitch. It is only a taut flesh temple fraught with trying. You cry and cry, but I know you're living quiet inside, like a mother at mass, like a new baby first yell, like a building squawk. Hannah. I only want you alive on arrival. Hannah, I only want your loudest sound. Thank you. Thank you. Silent stunner. To remember anything is a miracle. To have shock is a marvel. To be a long-necked bird. Two breaths in, one breath out, to a man teaching me how to float. Breath held, cheeks puffed with science, arms crucifix wide, legs open for service. Cheers to Adele, to me cheersing myself in a mirror, to half my body in a glass, to Elizabeth Bishop in mirrors and fish, to these tiny tits I never believed in cheers. To whiskey for 10 years, then no whiskey for four years, then to whiskey every fucking poem, cheers. I used to tell my drunk man, bring me some water, drink some water, man. It's all of your body and most of your tears, and don't you want to re remember my birthday, and my tiny tits? But fish fucking water, but you're only wet. Cheers.
to never breaking anything in my body but my will, to always staying shh. shh. Thanks. Um, this is a, I, I always introduce this poem as a longer poem, but I, I feel like I often write long poems, but it's, it's titled Chronicas, which is pronounced, it's, it's a Portuguese, it's derived from a Portuguese um, writing form, Chronicas, where they would publish kind of daily journalistic um, happenings in the daily papers. And so they were often vignettes or excerpted and um, highly personal and kind of like quick and consumable. Chronicas. There are days when I'm completely in love with my own potential. Tattooed a ski mask on my knee, I forgot the mouth, but still a new knee now. My hands are almost always wet. It's not just the dishes, it's the sweat of my past. It's the sickness in the air. It is ink or avocado or dog tongue. My mother calls and apologizes. My mother calls and asks, need an idea for a poem? Always. There is so much time lately. My hips are bored and eating themselves. My entire self a monument sinking into itself and to itself. I'm waiting on a package. I'm waiting for light less enough to drink a beer real fast over the sink. I've lived in so many towns, made entire lives for myself, myself in places I'll never remember. They've been left there, still showing up, still sweeping dog hair from the floor. One day, in 2002, I jumped from such a height into a riverbed red as a lie and broke every bone in my heart. Remember when that hawk ripped a bluebird to shreds in the yard? Remember when I was so nervous I didn't speak a word for three months? Remember the eclipse? The moonshine and effort we all obsessed over and sadly documented? If I make my own body into a piece of art, no one can touch it. What will happen when I completely fall apart? How will my blight look in kaleidoscope? Remember when the professor asked us to make a list of five things we'd grab from our homes with only five minutes and in the face of disaster? Mom, 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 mom. I haven't lived with my mother in 20 years. There's no word that means both magnolia and gross. One time I got my hair cut and I was literally a better woman afterwards. One time I drove 19 hours straight for a dude who broke up with me mid-thrust. One time it didn't mean anything to be stupid. We were just eating and anyone can hunt. There are days when I set an alarm for a beer. There are days when I research being a cam girl. There are days when I align myself with power and hate myself for it. My mother leaves me voicemails. Maybe you've been kidnapped. There's an online course on happiness. Call your brother. Y'all, my brother is so precious. There isn't a world that lets you talk about being in love with your brother. I'd marry every member of my family. <laughs> oh, it's gross. It's really gross. <laughs> Sometimes my hands are so soggy, I coat them in cornstarch and sit palms up for 20 minutes. I watch 90 Day Fiance. The only thing I've ever done in 90 days is change my whole life. One time I took a boy home from the bar and told him I worked for the government. One time I confused sugar with salt in my coffee. It was delicious. What is the word for devotion laced with psycho? Ooh, psycho. Please think I'm cool. Please adopt a pet. What's another word for Adele, like a utensil? There are days when I call my mother so many times I image search mother lovers. The results are disturbing. <laughs> there are days when the sun is so mellow yellow, I believe in chain mail. Who's got 20 friends? 20 moms. Call me out of pocket. Call everything, everything. Call me by my name. Uh, Adele. Adele. It's a whisper version. 
This April, in the morning, I saw a starling lift a baby's foot from the grass. The beak a tool, the foot a lineage, a little blood, only a little blood and an entire human foot defied gravity. That is what a mouth can do. Thank you. When I first got sober, I worked in restaurants all of my 20s. And when I first got sober, I'm obviously not sober anymore, it's fine. And I took the job, I took a job that was like the exact opposite, you know, I thought of being sober, so I worked in a blood bank. I worked in transfusion diagnostics. And I didn't know what I was doing. I worked for a bar fly. I was super fucking bored. And I would kind of go on Wikipedia and just like waste all my time. And at this, this is at the same time that Behind the Candelabra came out. And I got really into Liberace. Yeah. And I went nuts on like a Liberace black, black, you know, a deep Wikipedia hole. Um, which is a biopic, you should all watch it. But you know, he was born in a call, uh, like Hitler and Mozart, and as I've learned, like a lot of people are born in calls, but whatever. And so he would, he had all his, his young male lovers and he would fund their, their um, plastic surgery. And the, the goal, the ultimate motive was to, for them to transform themselves into looking like him, right? So they would have this, all this plastic surgery to recreate their faces and the image of him. So he was essentially in love with and fucking himself, which I kind of don't think is that weird. <laughs> and this poem came out of that research experience. It's called Idolatry for Dummies. <laughs> Liberace had his lovers turn their faces into his own like a man mirror. The opposite of this gesture is something spiritual for sure. I'm constantly reminded that religion is creepy, but perhaps our sole hope for kindness. But I'm tired of being kind, of always being on. And I'm low-key surprised that cults aren't more popular. Like who doesn't want to belong to stake every all-in move? their basket brimming with eggs, their moms crying into puffy pillows. If no one misses you, are you even real? Maybe this cynicism is just from one of me. How many me's are there? There's a me that grinds on anything angled, and another me that is mother of the year, and another me shut away with silence in a house for God. When I was a teen, a wimpy woman with husk hair held my heels and diagnosed my malaise, daddy issues. Wrong again, white people. When I was 25, a hairless man hovered his hands above my hips and asked how bad it hurt when Jack the Ripper tore my body from, from myself, asked if I even knew how many centuries I'd been alive. Oh, please, sweet God of my dreams, of my felicious foxhole, let me die with a poem in my hand, with my own face, with no one to regret their birth. My life is so small, you can mail it to your mother. Liberace had a Steinway in every room of his home. My lover says pianos require round rooms, and I wonder if Liberace's home was bubbles, was full on foam. I don't mean to be so withholding. I don't mean to drag the carrot to hint a treat. I'll get to it. Would you switch your face for me? Could you take the pain? Would I touch you more if we were me? Would I love I? Where would I go? Foamy, foamy me, all faced and heathen, all I. The shark. You vet of mystery, you vet of viet. Dead eyes, deep dead shark eyes in a freezer full of fish scale. What fucked wound made you? Made your wild soul out at night. Wild and sore at the cherry bar every time, every shift. And I got tip 20 on five, 100 on 20. A lot of love from you, a lot of wicked want, hammerhead. You vet of hideaway, you vet of secrets. 
A shipping container home, so no suspect, no Charlie Chance, and the heavy iron door slides on the track, locks past a certain point either way, locked in or locked out. I asked about the bug out bag on a butcher hook. The clean light seeping from under the only possible no way back. And you said, anything you want, I will do. Vet of Viet, vet of black sheep, vet of whitewash van filled with scraps of metal and a little bit of nature too. Beneath the grow lights, a plastic tub of soil and dated family photos, nudie mags, towers of high life, bags and bags of stems and leaves. Know this about the shark. If he says he loves you, I'm sorry. If he says never before my black eyes, he means black like blood under the moon. And if no one knows anything, if no one knows you fucked a murdery old man, be fair to only yourself. I feel like I'm running over time. Okay. Livestock advice. I just have a couple more poems. Not sure if the death doom was lore or my own proclivity towards morbidity, but I heard there were once bald cows here. All hairless and slippy, and the wind whipped like whipping will do through this valley quick as a quip, as a bad decision in the cows, their live leather crinkly and taut, couldn't stand the constant touch, the softest grief there is, there ever was, and there ever would be for those naked ninnies, naked ninnies, those meat feet with god eyes, with sucky udders and man brands. Cause they froze solid one storm, tight to the ground like a tombstone, struck cold and dumb as sorbet. Y'all, I'm saying the bald cows died bald. I'm saying bundle up, we ain't all made right. Miss America. It's cold out, so I walk the dog more than usual and listen to podcasts and pretend I'm solving murders while my mutt relieves himself ecstatically as though the entire world is watching. I text photos of the dog shitting to my man because life is hard and craps are fucking funny. In my heart, I am broken and bored. If I was a missing woman, I'd be a vowel in an easy word like panic. I'd stuff my body into the barrel myself, all renaissance, all hideaway. I'd dream Ahab's dream. I'd be my own white whale. On these winter walks, nothing is safe for my obsession. The winds whip like a proud daddy. Gutter water delicate only on top. Fat rats slow and sleepy from the crisp. I lock all the doors, I clutch keys, I take my phone everywhere, constantly turning back. I'm so ready for Moby, for that big, big. My peg leg trembles, my crew fucks off. The dog knows nothing and I recognize how wildness can fail, how feral is too honest, it's like death row, all that fate, all that womp womp. The doomed only know one thing, without the moon, water wouldn't fight back. To say it straight, Ahab rocks my socks. I'm jonesing for bad company. I'm setting myself up for abduction. You got a knife, I got a throat. I got something even smarter than that, and this is the part that hurts. Think about what you love the most, and then kill it. All right, this is my last poem. Um, thank you all for coming to hear poetry. Which, I mean, really, like, I'm listening, and, you know, I, I look around, I'm like, oh, they're listening. Um, this, this poem is for my lover. It's about, it's about my lover. He, I am marrying him, so he's my fiance, which sounds dumb, but lover sounds exciting. His name is Shane. I'm, a, I'm, I'm very codependent. Um, it's called Horny in Wyoming. 
I'm at the age of almost the middle of not really, but 40 feels closer than ever. And as I was going, as I was saying, I'm at the age of listless desire, of domestic domain, of following delicious men on Instagram, of devouring literary smut, of married, but still sex, still bad. And who makes these rules anyway? Why we gotta stuff it all down? Why we gotta lust for the, lust like berries for the sun, like anyone for anyone? And I'm here where promise is a color-hued pervy, where I'm in all black like the heated heifers of a pl high plains night, here where nothing gets gone, nothing gets got, and I find myself inside myself and fear the reveal, fear the hide, here where I am where I am, and the night is bitter black and the men's so rough, I die for the die for the dream of fingers sandpapering my throat, of something hairy and hived pushing my blithing body down, the sagebrush scratching my thighs, the fist-sized stones calling me home where my man sits sinewy and city sun loving me like a car battery, like all hot and metal. Home where the asphalt rips our clothes, where we stare into each other's eyes, holy city-fied and bright, where the sun blinds the blinds and we hold and 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 hold each other and on. Thank you. Give it up for Adele again. You see, I was never in a band. All right. In his most recent poetry, Hank Rousseau explores the tension between the Roman conception of natura, abundance and its empire tending inclinations, and in the Greek, industrial age, episteme, new shit. <laughs> the poetics is cross-platform, autocritical, wide, civilizational. This works more Lucretius than Wordsworth, more Waldman than Ted Hughes. Here, science, a uh, tumos to wrestle science, matters. Here's life's randy reach towards the stars, netted in line by line. Here's freaky fables of global psychic terrains from which to stop, stand, and go. His earlier work, which will be treated to here tonight, as in his book, Shemiza, Hank navigates the gaps between the culturally spent artifacts and the culturally combusted present. His aesthetic tactics aren't born out of a reign of spontaneous sentiment, but rather are a constructivist process of cultural excavation. Writ large, our luminous altar cells from South Africa's mist-covered past that get choreographed into what Emmy Césaire called a rendezvous of victory. Nimbly threading history's objects, nation, city, self, peoples, Hank guides us into and out of Imperium's capture zones. The result is a new global poetics that confronts nationalist myth-making while invigorating the appetite for redefinitions of, quote, citizenship. Pretty damn dazzling poetry, you'll see. Hank Rousseau is originally from Cape Town, South Africa. His book-length poem, Fordham, Fordham, Fordham University Press 2018, won the Poets Out Loud Editor's Prize. An assistant professor, Hank teaches in the English department at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. He's also the co-director of the UL Lafayette Creative Writing Program. The anthology, Best American Experimental Writing 2018 features an excerpt from Shemiza, 
Kawami Davis and Chris Avani included his chapbook, The Water Archives, in the box set, New Generation African Poets, Tano. His writing has appeared in Poetry Daily, the Paris Review, Boston Review, and many other places. Warm welcome, please, for Hank yourself. Well, so uh, what an honor to be here, to read after Adele, and to be part of such a vibrant and fantastic reading series here in the city of New Orleans, Cape Town's more glamorous cousin. <laughs> uh, but seriously, the splice, this is great. Uh, this is great to see such a pro series, beautiful graphics, great guests and um, <laughs> such fantastic introductions, clearly. <laughs> so yeah, thanks Rodrigo and, uh, and Henry and Sean and everybody else involved in making, making us come together and be together in, in the moment of poetry. So as uh, Rodrigo alluded to, I'm gonna read some new work um, that's coming out of, I guess, three thoughts or movements, one of which is I became an American, for better or for worse. <laughs> <laughs> I carry the passport uh, after 20 years of being a non-American, but here. Um, and so with that comes a kind of responsibility or a, or a feeling about where you are um, in this place. And, and, and out of that really is uh, images that echo my own childhood, you know, uh, driving a lot between Lafayette and Houston, you know, just, it's just like, a, <laughs> it's just like refinery alley, right? Uh, uh, as you go through Lake Charles, like for the second time that week, you're like, all right, that's where all those cute little gas stations in Vermont, you know, those, those cute ones from the 50s where you put the cute gas into your car and everybody's like, oh, it's got to come from somewhere. Well, yeah, it, it comes from here. <laughs> uh, and, and, and my dad kind of um, pushing me more in the ecological direction as he's kind of found a lot of happiness, like way the fuck out in northern Vancouver Island with like, you know, like grizzlies all roaming through the town. And being like, wow, this is this is a special continent. This is a crazy, crazy special continent. So here we go. Elevated flare. The refinery amid the marshland of my earliest memories repeats itself on the Gulf. Distillation tower, coker, flare stack. The horizon interrupted by chrome hills. The tower ushers naphtha into the next phase, tar at the base becoming the asphalt I am on, near Sabine Pass, hurricane sector soon to be abandoned. Open windows, drive slow. Somewhere, the promised sea, mud beige waves. Songbirds will arrive in a rush into the refuge of oaks, contingent on the Chenier Ridge, a spring bird storm, I'm here for, as if my brother's asthma at night, his nebulizer and cheap pajamas, our trailer adjacent to Caltex, furtive refinery of the Republic. I park and walk out on the levee, a cattle path, across the marsh. The cattails high, I cannot see the rufous crown of the swamp sparrow. I know his markings, the text of his feathers. Vivid, rusty wings, subtler browns, grays, buff, and black of the body. I wish him near, his song against asthma. Song mouth open as a cave without sorrow. Trill, statistically constant for the last 1,537 years. Bayesian computation says, his crystal syllables pass down from sparrow to sparrow, his culture. A scythe of white smoke drifts across the marsh from crone hills. Crematoriums of the earth, owned by Aaron Co., burn the seabed's crude flesh.
so this next poem, I'm, I'm not in the habit of saying, well, this poem's coming out in this in this journal. Isn't that great? Um, but this poem, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it's coming out in Poetry Magazine in the Ow! September issue. Yeah, it feels good. And I mention it because it's been 10 years, people. It's been a decade of sending, you know, <laughs> stuff. And, uh, you know, it feels good when you, when you, you know, you persist, you try. And you're like, all right, you know, this is good. And then you can forget it and just keep going on being an artist and having fun. Passerine. The salt marsh pale green near the conifer broadleaf. And the eye who walks into a refuge in silence as if gazing at the blue flame of being. Language's pilot light. This eye is seen by an owl blur first. Wings cast like a net onto the late afternoon. A surge inside as if owl prey bursts out my chest thicket to hide. A small dun terror amid some trees. The owl near enough to deplore, to index, strix varia, denies my presence. His pellets under the red spruce dance with volfur and regurgitated crab. I'm a broken animal. Nothing eats me. If my hair were often coiled in the shit of something larger, would it make the night night? Something to be in awe of other than language aspire. Uh, so this next poem, um, I don't know if you've seen the 1940s films of Maya Darren, just, yeah. wow, yeah. right? Um, so this is, this is kind of in her wake, uh, you know, kind of imagining, well, what if a cuttlefish was like dreaming like a Maya Darren film? <laughs> uh, so it's called Darren Island. Um, Days flicker in the boreal woods brings to mind the window skin of a cuttlefish asleep, its body a trembling aspen as it dreams me into both and being. For I am a stranger to the rock tripe, lichen on the glacial erratic sandpaper, and the sheets of feather moss under the pine spruce fir that edge into the uncertain shore. Under the pine, spruce fir, crowberry, silverweed, and goose tongue, and the granite cracks, and down into the interland of the dog whelks and sea lettuce, where I lope inside the tidal cinema, its foam, a Mobius strip looping as the rush of the sea unmaps this island, bitten by wolf trees until the cuttlefish wakes. So uh, some of you might be like, huh, what happened to uh, Kank's uh, post-colonial uh, bands, you know? <laughs> and uh, you know, it's there, it's subtle. Uh, wolf trees in New England, in Maine, are, are like the trees that are left where everything else was cut down. That's the wolf trees. Uh, so if you go into the woods in Maine, and it's like, oh, a lot of trees, and then there's this big-ass tree. That's the wolf tree. And um, that's the one tree left in the meadow, you know, that had the king slash on it. Don't cut this, gonna use it for my ships. I'm gonna carry sugar. All right. Sun River Rehab. This is a poem is uh, from some time out in Oregon. In a far corner of the rehabilitation cage, the eagle hunches on the gravel at an uneven angle. Her left hallux, a talon once long enough to pierce on impact the lungs of a deer calf amputated by a headlight, her back to me. Golden eagles offer a rare alarm call. Kiki 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 kiki. I imagine it came too late. Her male flushed a jackrabbit onto the road. She, the fiercer, the one to kill. Traffic hidden by a bend or a hill until she stooped into the oncoming. The eagle tries to peer at me standing at the mesh. She looks back, orphic, over her shoulder. Her left eye detects but shadows, the other eye blind, blinding. The headlight detached her retinas. Nothing comes from nothing. 
simile is of the same birth as mycelium. In the feedback loops of evolution, lungs were swim bladders, feet, fins. My fetal eye echoed hers as an embryo. In Adam with an iPhone, I name things the eagle cannot see. The open ponderosa, snow bereft mountains, the high desert sunlight and the column of smoke from the wildfire to the south, funneling ash skyward as the golden eagle shuffles on the gravel to wedge herself further away into the cage dark. The lyric eats its own tail. A life form held in mind becomes an image of that mind, her cage mind, language, a leather effigy, a lure for feeling, Whitehead says, by which I turn the cortex hooded eagle to hunt on my behalf. So this one's for Houston, uh, <laughs> Hurricane Harvey. Um, yeah, I don't need to talk about that stuff to you all. Uh, yeah, a lot of rain. Tatarita. When the bayou rose above the Wall Street Bridge in the daylight flood, bats asleep underneath drowned in the thousands. Is sentience the wonder of sonar or knowledge of pain? Free-tailed bats, ears cup for echo, had roosted seven layers deep in the concrete trap. The rain erased the sun. I wept in the dark. Cars in the flooded lot hidden like alligators. One summer at twilight some years later, I visit the bats of Wall Street, who have syllable acoustics and skin glands that rub this bridge and no other with the odor of home. I lie on the grassy bank near the bridge in a crowd of my species. Children's voices echo and the trees open their arms to the wind. Is sentience a hurricane radar? Or knowledge it will happen again? 300,000 bats drown out the traffic, each the weight of a pencil writing in the dusk. Uh, so the last poem in this, in this uh, manuscript, or this part of the manuscript, um, is titled Sayward, which is the name of my dad's village. Uh, <laughs> it's like 300 people um, up on the northern end of uh, Vancouver Island. And um, it's such a silent place to be. And yet, you know, it's Canada. It's like free healthcare. <laughs> people are connected. Uh, so I'm trying to get to that little sense of euphoria uh, to find, you know, it's kind of amazing to see a parent finally like find their place in the world <laughs> at the age of 70 and be like, hey, I'm happy. I'm like, wow, uh, it's possible. Uh, <laughs> Sayward, the bear at the mouth of the Quinsom River snaps the back of the fat, dark-bellied salmon, my father says on the phone. The salmon is blue, silver, green in the sea. Now he's river dark, the dark green of return. My father says the sunlit bear takes her new green salmon into the riparian woods to feed herself asleep in carcass hungry trees. Haven't seen the salmon run, haven't seen my father in so long. These are sea bears, he says. Long range grizzlies swim the strait for the island's salmon addled river mouth. He's new at home. An immigrant, I miss his white hair. How do I know you are not a bear, I say. If bears can open jars, bears can phone sons. <laughs> the she-bear being bear, he says, leaps again from barnacled rock onto a dark salmon tail cord who sidewinds wildly as if still leaping up river inside the bear's mouth. Will he call me after he's gone? 
to sing of salmon on the foam? Or will he be food for the trees near the river and the sea rack? One day the phone will ring and a bear will be in silence on the other side. So I'm just going to read the opening section. Um, some of you may have heard this before. Um, the opening section of uh, my book, Commissa. And if you notice that Rodrigo said it differently, that's great. That's part of the point. And I'm going to just read like a couple paragraphs at the beginning of the book that just kind of set it up and set up why the title of the book can be so uncertain and unstable. Um, in 1990s Cape Town, in the interregnum after the fall of apartheid, the poet Sandile de Kenny created Monday Blues, the city's first segregated reading series at Cafe Commissar on Cliff Street, hence my love for this space. Sandile, who had trained himself to write in his head while under detention without trial, read his work, his telegraphs to the sky from memory. Perhaps it was here the urban legend emerged. Commissar, we thought, meant place of sweet waters in the indigenous Ku language. And the waters the urban legend speaks of have run from Table Mountain to the sea, under the city itself, since before the Dutch ships. An untrammeled toponym from before the 1652 arrival of the VOC, or Dutch East India Company. Commissa became a wellspring for the cultural reclamation I witnessed in newly democratic Cape Town. In the 2000s, Cafe Commissa shut down to make way for a real estate agency, a symptom. Ubisunt Sandile. Turns out Commissa was a linguistic error, haha. Colonists likely mistook the coup words for water, fresh water, to mean an actual place. Still, its legendary springs and streams exist. I've gone down into tunnels on the mountainside, waded in the underground water, surfaced from a manhole almost at the sea. And the echo of its promise of the nascent city of names into being haunts us on the double album Dream State. The jazz composer Kyle Shepard recorded the track Kamissa, Zamissa. It's X, X A M I S S A, stands for in part the multiple ways in the intersecting languages of Cape Town, past and present. Ku, Cham, Afrikaans, Kosa, you may pronounce that first consonant. And I'll just say quick, um, in the book itself, the, the, word, the letters, the acronym VOC, Dutch East India Company, are like kind of a logo in the text. And that's because it was the first logo. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> it was the, the 17th century swoosh, uh, was the VOC, they invented it, like the stock market too was invented by the Dutch in the, in the 17th century period. Um, and so, um, the Dutch West India Company colonized New York, so that's why New Yorkers speak of stoops, like some Cape Townians speak of stoops. Um, but it also meant that um, the Dutch East India Company funded slavery from the Indian Ocean, um, which fundamentally altered the, the history of Cape Town. Um, this first section is called Rearrival. The loops of telephone wire on creosote poles copy in dusk lit sine waves the arcade flight pattern of the city stardings. Red wing, shadow body, the birds cloud the stone courtyard of the VOC slave lodge and parking garages and eaves. This is civil twilight. I have been absent for seven years. Murmuration, collective noun for the cloudburst of starlings in the early winter sky, my brother says. Starlings on the telephone wires line the foothill streets of Walmer Estate. Our roadside perception of the houses and warehouses and lots sloping toward the harbor below has been anchored momentarily among the crowd and the footbridge, once segregated, Blancas slash Niblancas, 
with legislative sheet metal and now a suspended desire line above Rui Chakla Boulevard, renamed for the president imprisoned on the island, often visible from here. The tarmac with his name contours against the table-shaped mountain as it bisects the city. Kamisa versus Cape Town, the city in the brochure, little more than a summer dress, all air, color, and light cast off onto the indigenous peninsula, like a beautiful wet bag over the mouth of. Oh, <laughs> sorry, it's a section, but you know, I'll, I'll take the applause. Kurukwako uh, <laughs> means, in the crossed out language, mountain in the sea. The standard bank sign on the foreshore, cement land reclaimed from the sea and the descendants of enslaved commissions who had launched slender fishing boats there from the shoreline now buried under rubble, flickers on blue against the close of day. Kamisa, the city at nightfall double lit by the artificial and the fleeting electric sunset. The early sodium vapor street lamps echo the burnt orange. Domestic servants leaving Walmer Estate cross the footbridge in their nightly catalysis downhill. Shop right bags in hand or balanced on their heads, wages tithed to get home to Lavender Hill, Mitchell's Plain, Lost City, Kayalicha, Langa, Guguletu, outside the city gates, as the touts and the white minibus taxis echo the Meswim. Freedom, 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 Walmer. On the footbridge, my brother and I look at the city in silence. Daylight has not yet left the avocado green facade of Gazala food and cafe on the corner, the corner of, and day glow vies with the fluorescent lit shelves. Soap, matches, pulches, stacked behind the shopkeeper at rest in the doorway, marking time until the tidal hiss of the one or two bus. On the roads below, Melbourne and Rudabloom narrowing downhill, the stoops on either side darken first. You must be hungry, my brother says. I have aged without him. He lives near the abutment of the bridge. Starlings in his attic and the dock cranes, nuisance democracy, frame the sea as if to lower the sun, a starboard red container beyond the coastal shelf. The shipping line of sunlight, leaving for. In the city, begin and begin again, sleeps graffiti. This is a, a quote from uh, a young student, Songo Tanisi. The city is tidal in the day People stream into the city to Sabenza, to Teta, to be here by the sea. I take the bus from Philippi for over two hours to get to high school here. At night, the tide of us departs, and it's the Umlungu city again. The sea foam. Mm. I recur in the city, song lit, in Songo's tidal city. Now a landscape, now a room. Now the Cape, now Kamisa. Urban legend, El Dorado, place of sweet waters, plural for the sake of its springs, the water archive, incipient on the mountainside, artesian and running under the city, asleep. The city, separate as the sleep of another. And I'll just say here that uh, though people love to make this comparison with Nolans about wherever they're from, uh, there really is an echo between Cape Town and the city in, in the second line processions in Cape Town every year, which have copied and adapted the iconography of second lines here down to the spinning umbrellas every year. If one were scattered at the end from a cardboard urn after the flood, with a view of the swa descending to the bites and the coves, the sea bitten coast one was born far from, one's beginning forgotten a handful of South African ash. Yeah. Even the ash would echo names of water, distant water, the whaleback ledge lighthouse across the Piscataqua, whose origins bound the harbor and the tidal mouth, split into salmon falls in the Kachiko, rapid foaming water, fed by the Ella, the Mad, and the Isinglass, 
rivers striated by glacial ice and rising from the nubble and the cold rain, ponds, replacements for Kamesa, place of. So I'm going to end the reading with um, two short poems, which exist in this book, <laughs> uh, kind of, um, that return to that image where I opened of the oil refinery. So some of the allusions to that imagery in that opening poem on the Gulf. Um, these last two poems go there. Twin soldiers. My brother and I grew up with wind in Ridgewood. Starter homes constructed on the sands amid the refinery and the oil depot. A neighborhood of beige, storage vats and bungalows, the column of fire above the flare stack, perpetual, burning off the excess. The plume of smoke was a weather vane for the southeaster, ushering over the sewage farm and the closed race course to methane out to sea. Hidden in the coppice in the vacant lot opposite, the home we avoided, he and I dug a pit inside a Dunlop tractor tire discarded in the sand and covered it up with hacksaw tree limbs. I was the oldest by seven minutes, the foxhole his idea. He would crouch there, glasses off, and watch the shadows of the restless acacia leaves. Without the wind-blown sand to promise us, down in the foxhole we could play gin rummy on top of the pulpit toolbox. I had discarded the screwdrivers to stash my cap guns in there and his asthma inhaler. For the instant, in the night often, the wind swiveled northwest, pulling the methane like a blanket over us. If he asphyxiated, I'd go AWOL from the foster home of the Fox Hall. I made him overdose on his inhaler, burst after burst, until his skinny frame in threadbare pajamas, shuddered with the medicine. Thanks. All right, and this last poem, uh, it's called The Dream of the Road. Um, so it's kind of an ode to um, the fact that my dad <laughs> Oh man, how do I even admit this? My dad was a, the leader of a Christian motorcycle gang. <laughs> uh, I'll, maybe I'll just leave it there. Uh, no, he's given up that life, let's just say. you know, Now he communes with the bears. But, uh, <laughs> but here we go, the dream of the road. <laughs> and so, my father rode the devil out of the Kawasaki 1300cc six-cylinder I'd wash Sundays. We, the kingdom riders, colors and blazoned on our backs, a biker in a helmet, visor down, riding the cross full throttle. Fingers clasped like studs to his leathers, I rode pillion, the rest of the kingdom riders, a slew of black geese. Worm Ibi, short for Ibrahim, converted with his girl Jessie, who was beautiful, from the rival black widows to ride with us on his Yamaha behind the Kitsadic Kawasaki. In the haze of the semi-desert Peru, beyond the speed limit, I remember the windmills of where I was born. Jesse died young, tire blossomed, the mountain pass, the valley below. Ibi got out of hospital, lung punctured by his rib. We went to see him on the other side of the city where his people were allowed to live. In the pine box without the blue helmet, Jessie had a small head of curls. Her mouth was shut. She dialect my father's name, turn Eugene into Dini. Sounds like genie. In Afrikaans, anything can happen. His Oma, his grandmother, had almost handed him my father 30 years before. She'd held a pillow slip over his face in the crib. Lazarus in diapers. If my father wasn't home, his ghost was. I'd wrestle him on the carpet, 
rough with Lego, to name me again a nation if I won, and hoist me where Jesse was in heaven, an upended bucket with a palace on top, a blaze like Celtics, the refinery, my nightlife. Keep it going, keep it going for Hank and Adele. <laughs> Who, what, where, when, and why? Y'all, poetry. When is the next place? Yeah. Labor Day weekend. Labor Day, Labor Day. Labor Day weekend. September 3rd. So in a couple weeks, it's going to be Brad Richard, who was here earlier this evening. Brad, 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 Brad. And uh, Ruben Quesada, who is also coming in town, who is splicing with Brad Richard. But thank you all for coming tonight and being here at this place, at this moment, at this time, and spending your time on a Saturday night not going to Red Restaurant. If you went to Red Restaurant, thank you for changing before you came here. <laughs> Except for you, Cameron, you're still wearing a red dress. Thank you for coming and listening to this delightful kick ass poetry tonight. Please come next time, September 3rd, on Labor Day weekend to listen to some more splice poetics and poetry. Thank you. Get a drink for your bartender. Tip your bartender. Tip your bartender. Tip your bartender. Yeah, you're right. Adele, thank you for kicking ass tonight. Hey, thank you for kicking ass tonight. Let's go kick the bartender's ass and tip her up. All right.